Thank you for choosing this video to watch. Behind me, you'll see some boxes here, there, and there. They are the product of the work I've been doing the past few months in the background. I haven't really talked about them because I wasn't really sure if they would work. And uh, I've gotten to a point where I can show what I've done and I'm pretty confident that they'll work. They're not synthesizers, they're not, but they are sound making devices. They're not really keyboards, but they're a little, you push a button and sound comes out. So I'll call them a trigger board for lack of a better term. Also because I, the main piece of uh, technology I'm using is a little device called a wave trigger. And that is something I've used before. There's actually a box up here in like a, a virtual box that you can click up here in the corner of the screen uh, that'll, lead, that'll lead you to the video about this uh, wave trigger device that I've done before and that's led me to make these. So I'm going to swivel around and show you the inside real quick. If you haven't seen the video, don't click away yet. You can click away later. The little question mark will, will remain up there in the corner throughout the video for you. So wait. Like I said, this is the inside of the box and this little device here is an Arduino Nano. Arduino is a little microcontroller and the Nano is just the model they used for it. And this is uh, sending signals to this little device, which is a Robert Sonics wave trigger. Uh, a wave is just the WAV extension of a sound file. I pronounce it wave. So uh, this was a design that I, I adapted from Look Mum No Computer's drum machine. Um, I've adapted it to my own uses. And uh, I wanted, let me flip this around so you can see. See, this just has patch points where you can uh, send a signal in and get a signal out. Uh, and this will sequence uh, a number of sounds so that you can have drum sounds or any other kind of sounds. They're just recorded sounds on the little, uh, on the little SD card, which you see right here. There. So. What I wanted was something I could trigger myself with my own little fingers. Kind of like a keyboard, but using the same technology. So I found the Robert Sonics MP3 trigger, which I will show you next. So same idea here is the wave trigger. It's just a, basically a little microcontroller and signals come in through these ports here and trigger sounds that I have recorded on this little SD card. Uh, this has no Arduino on it because he's designed these to be triggered just by themselves. So as you can see also over here I have uh, a couple speakers. There's one there and there's one over on the other side. And a little mixing board that I've put over here. So this will, this is also, there's an amplifier in there that will amplify the sounds that are coming out. So basically this is an all-in-one unit. Each one of these buttons is assigned to a different port on that, on one of those mp3 triggers. Uh, obviously you could use one or three or as many as you want. You just assign more and more buttons or less and less buttons. Uh, on this one, I don't know if I'll have to show this, but uh, the last eight are free because of two reasons. Let's see here. See, those last aren't connected to anything. I just they're just free hanging wires. Because I wondered if I could use them for something else. I'm not sure. This is sort of a, an open project. I can label these. This is just aluminum flashing, so I can write pencil on them. I could put a piece of masking tape on it and label each one. They don't have to be notes on a scale. They could be different sounds altogether. It could be anything I want. But the limitation is the MP3s play one at a time, so you can't hold two together and make a chord. I 
kind of envisioned this as a sort of a, a parlor keyboard, you know, like you would have in Victorian times where you're not performing for a large group, you're just, you just have some group of friends sitting around a table and you just play your little harpsichord. Obviously this can be programmed with any sound you want. So there's no volume control on this, it's just speakers coming out, energy going in, buttons to make the sound. Similarly, this box is very much the same thing. It's, uh, it uses the same technology. There are fewer buttons, but they're beefier and it's stronger uh, panel. Also, I have a, a button or a switch there that will uh, either turn off these speakers so that you can plug through into an, a mixer or a sound effects board or whatever and play the sounds as they, you know, as you want them to be, or you can play them as they've been recorded on the MP3. This is not using uh, Robert Sonic's device. It is using a device that I've also used before. Uh, I bought on Adafruit. Uh, this is an Arduino, and this is a device designed specifically to fit on top of an Arduino. You can see that these ports are connected to it by a little header pins. I could take it off, I'm not going to. But it's called an audio shield. I bought it on Adafruit. Uh, and they actually also sell uh, an Arduino clone that'll fit just exactly on their uh, audio shield. I think they call it a wave shield. Uh, also on this side, I have the same mixer set up and a little amplifier so that I can play really loud music coming through. It, this could be like a stage performance thing. And this is what I envisioned this to be, more of a something you could really pound on on stage. It's rugged and uh, I am gonna make a screen for this. That's gonna be another project in the future is to 3D print. I'm just learning Fusion 360. So I'm gonna design a little bezel with a uh, some kind of metal screen to fit over that so it's more sturdy. These uh, also, this one is also uh, one by one, but uh, one by one. You can only play one sound at a time, but the way I've wired it up is that because I'm using two of them, I can uh, play a chord if I want to by playing both of these at the same time. This one actually is sequential, so I could play one here and one here at the same time. But this is more uh, intentionally chord driven. So. I've been trying to figure out for a long time, which is a capacitive touch keyboard or trigger board. It's just a, a piece of copper that I've um, soldered through this panel on the top and inside. So in here you can see, I'm going to go into detail about this, but this is another Arduino. It's called a Mega because it has a lot of ports and it's connected to this Tsunami, which also has a lot of ports. And also these ports are stereo and can be played stereophonically. So that's a good thing. This is sort of like the apex of my projects. I also have to say that all these projects 
are completely documented online. You don't have to have a whole lot of experience or knowledge in electronics to do them. Just a lot of diligence and uh, willingness to claw through forums if you get stuck. So, uh, I actually started uh, documenting the process of making this stuff in the middle of making this because I was actually kind of confident that I could do it. So I'm going to uh, uh, swipe to the side in a second and uh, you'll see how this was made. Well, there I go, sitting down to do some soldering. Switching out my glasses because I can't see very far and I can't see very close. And I need different glasses to see different things. So there's the Robert Sonic Tsunamis and the Arduino Mega all kind of splayed out on the workbench. And the uh, the keyboard, the back of the keyboard with wires sticking out. And I just, I'm just going to be soldering those wires into my little uh, arrangement down there. Uh, this is going to be a short construction segment. I'm not going to show you the whole thing. Just wanted to take a moment and uh, thank you for watching. You've been watching for about 10 minutes now and I haven't even played any music. Um, this is going to go on for another 10 minutes probably and I, I'm i going to separate out two different videos. One of them which I basically show you that yes, I did make the thing and then another one where I actually play music with it. So uh, at the end of this one, you'll see the, all these devices working and uh, and then later on I'll publish a different video. So thanks for watching. Please continue. Okay, I'm just pausing to show that I've uh, connected all of the grounds of each of these devices and all the voltage ins of each of these devices to it, their own separate little strip on this strip board. And when I uh, attach this panel, this power panel, to the to the outside of the case, then I'll just feed it through and then stick the voltage in to one side and the, the negative to the other. That's how it goes. These are for the jacks, and that is what this is for. This is tip time. Going to talk about tips. So this is a. Uh, a mono jack socket and this is a stereo jack socket. The way you know is that the mono jack socket only has three little posts. One, two, three. Uh, this post is usually just to hold it in to the to the case or into whatever you're mounting it on. It's, like, it's just more stability. And each of these is uh, one is for the tip of the jack. The tip of the jack right here. There we go. And this one is for the sleeve. And the tip of the jack is usually the um, signal end. It's where the, where the signal comes through. And this is the, usually the ground. So uh, how it works is, you can't see very well on this model because there's no end. But did you see how that little spring snapped open as it went by. That little spring there is now connecting to the sleeve. And then that goes to this wire, which goes to the ground. And this little spring, which I guess is right here, we'll watch this one, Shnup! connects to the, nip, the tip. And this goes to the signal end. So the stereo, which the reason why I'm installing a stereo jack socket on this is because these uh, tsunami wave triggers are stereo. They send out a stereo signal. So if I wanted to record a stereo sample, it would actually play them through if I corrected the, co correctly installed this jack socket. So the way this works is, where's my little, there it is. Here is a stereo jack. And you see the difference here between the stereo and the mono is that 
the stereo has this one extra section here. Tip, sleeve, and they call this the ring. So usually the, the tip and the ring are the right and the left uh, parts of the stereo, and this is the ground. So the way that works is, slide it in here, and you can see up inside, you see how that, that little spring there, that little spring there is touching the tip. Wait just a minute, mister, you say, shaking your finger at the screen. I saw three sections on that plug, but there are five terminals on that socket. What are those other terminals for? Well, as you can see from this section of the data sheet provided by the electronics manufacturer, they're called the ring shunt and the tip shunt. And these two things connect those two springs to ground when there's no plug inserted. That way it prevents hum. And we don't like hum, do we, precious? No, we don't. So as you can see from this other section of the data sheet, they've uh, figured out different ways of configuring those terminals for different uses. And the one that I've purchased is 2B. So it's just the ring sleeve and the, and the tip. So that's the end of this meta narration. And I'll return you back to the main narration now. So that little spring is connected to one of these little posts. And the other little spring right in here is connected to another post. And uh, this, this outside ring right here is connected to a final post. So how do you know? There's three sections here, right? But there's one, two, three, four, five posts. How do you know? Well, I got confused a lot, so I decided eventually that I would what I would do is take one of these uh, markers here and mark it and how do you know where to mark it well you take one of these here devices and you uh, well let's see what else, what do I do uh, what I what I would like to do is stick this in here just like that right and I have the other end here so I want to know which one is the ground so I connect this side to the ground of the jack and then I just touch there that means this little post and none of the other ones are connected to that to that ground only this one so I know this is the ground and I put a little G on there foreground then I go on to the next this middle one which I'm going to call the left and I go around touching I don't want to touch this one because it's not it's obviously the ground There we go. So that's the left. Right? No, this is the right. The tip is the tip. The tip is the right. And that's the right. Sorry, I just had to. I couldn't do it off camera. So this is a good tool. Use this tool. I'm waving it around so you can't see, but it's called the Pen Touch, and you can buy it at your local art store. Go do that. So now I know which ones to go where, and I, I have the. Uh, I've also done myself a favor by color coding myself. Uh, the, the purples are always the grounds. Pinks are always the L's, and uh, R's are always the reds. Uh, mnemonically, it's red for right. I don't know why. Um, because sometimes there's white, and white rhymes with right. But you never know. So this is how I'm going to do it. And then I'll catch you up later. 
Yes, this is test one. And as you'll hear in a few minutes, it didn't go quite as planned. Uh, it was triggering itself, but I was just so pleased to have sound. I decided to play with it a little bit. And I also wanted to take this opportunity to explain what exactly is capacitive touch. So the, this is not what should be happening. What should be happening is when my finger touches that conductive surface, uh, that surface is connected both to the Arduino, which is sending out uh, a bunch of pulses, and to the Tsunami, which is waiting for a pulse. My body is basically a big capacitor. It doesn't hold much energy, but it holds just enough to complete that circuit. So whatever post that pad is connected to on the Arduino sends a little signal on through to the Tsunami. And the little sample that's held on the SD card is the one that plays corresponding to whichever pad I touch. Here is a more successful uh, test. Um, some of the pads aren't working correctly, but at least it's doing what I tell it to do. There's still more corrections to be made, but they're more on the software side, because as you can tell, I have to hold my finger onto the pad in order to make the whole sample play. And that's just a preference that you can choose. Now, I should say that I've generalized and simplified just for the purpose of this video. It's a bit more complex, especially when you're not using a microcontroller to do the work for you. But this should give you an idea about what I'm doing as I'm playing these things. Before I play this, I want to give a quick tip. Uh, you'll notice reviewing that footage that I put a, everything on headers and I screwed everything in instead of gluing it and soldering it in solid because I want to give myself a chance if something needed to be fixed later, I could take it out and also to interchange parts in case one broke. Well, before I turn this on, I realized that um, when I, when I glued these little copper pads on, the, the uh, plywood was a bit bowed. And then when I screwed it down, it changed the solder on all these points. So some of these pads wouldn't work. And I didn't realize until I started trying to play it in the case. So I had to go downstairs and take it apart like that. So that's just, it looks kind of ugly, but that's okay because I'm gonna do another one that looks even better, even though I really love this pattern that the wood made. And this is just plywood that was in my garage. So this is a, a demo of the 